incredibly long sermon I'm about to preach. <laughs> God is plan is for them to be here next week so that you don't have to just hear from me again. Amen. Trying to uh, trying to keep some variety so that you all don't get bored and you know start doodling on the back of the chairs and stuff like that. So we're gonna go to the Word of God. What time is it? Let's see. It's uh, okay. I I might have time in the normal allotment of time to get this done. We're gonna we're gonna give it a good go. We're gonna wrap up um, the series that we've been in on end times this morning. Um, there's you know, like I joked last week, there's no shortage of material for sure. Uh, we could keep going and going and going, but there's some other things that I think we're gonna turn our attention to in the coming weeks. So we're going to wrap this up uh, this morning. If you want to stand with me for the reading of the Word of God, we are actually going to mess around and read uh, a whole chapter, albeit a short one. Second uh, Peter chapter 3, as we put a bow around all that this that we've been learning about the last days and what's coming. So Peter says this, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. And the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance." But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? I want you to take careful note of that. Looking for and hastening the coming of of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot, and blameless. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. Take note of that as well. Consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. And as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the Scriptures." You, therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Father, would you add the blessing of revelation and insight to our time in your word, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. This morning, let's see, for me to get to my water bottle, I kind of have to put to put my hat back on just for a second. So there's a federal law that in a church, we can't tell you how to vote. Did you know that? That if I tell you how to vote, 
they'll come in and swoop in and say, well, now you can't be tax exempt because you meddled in the politics because, of course, the political system is pure and untainted by the meddling of organizations. I've, I've noticed that, and therefore, I am not telling you who to vote for. Um, I didn't say anything. Y'all are just reading into it. I'm actually only wearing my hat because this is the same hat that at the polling place last time, they told me I couldn't wear this hat and vote. And I had to take my hat off. And, and then, and then uh, I had a confrontation, they called it. I guess they're used to really mild confrontations because to me, I wasn't even building up steam yet. But when the young lady said, what if it offended someone? And I said, I couldn't care less. In fact, I can't think of anything I care about less than that. And she said, well, sir, what if somebody, I said, people offend me all the time and no one cares. So I don't care. And the lady behind me in line suggested, put it on backwards, walk in so that when you turn into your voting thing. <laughs> See, this is why I love Wyoming, amen. I'm not from here, but I got here as quick as I could, praise the Lord. And so, uh, so not telling you who to vote for, just make sure you vote, amen, as many times as you can, praise God. Um, <laughs> so, so last week, um, we were dealing with some incredibly practical stuff in a sermon we called While We Wait. And we were talking about the fact that according to the Word of God, Paul tells us we carry this treasure of Jesus around in an earthen vessel, that these bodies aren't redeemed yet. In fact, uh, it was Romans 8.23 that I think I gave to her. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, which is the redemption of our body. And we were talking about the fact that this is why there can be such a big disconnect sometimes between what I believe and what can be working out in this body, because this body is not redeemed yet. And so my spirit is all fired up and healed and redeemed and ready to serve Jesus. And then this old tent sometimes is like, what? No, 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 no. And so he said we groan inside of ourselves. And I thought it was important that we just take a minute and acknowledge that and talk about it. And we actually got some feedback from a few people last week that were really encouraged because they had been told this demonic garbage that if something's wrong in their life, it means they don't believe God. And that is so hurtful. It makes me sick. I really get angry about it. Brother Dan and I were on the phone last night, and Carrie was laughing at me, because when him and I are on the phone, we just start preaching to each other. And when we got onto that topic, I told him, I said, I was so mad, I'm so mad about people that preach that, that I'll, I had to repent. And just so you know where I get it from, he laughed at me on the phone, and he says, brother, don't repent, that's just right. <laughs> he said, those men are from hell. And I said, okay, good enough then, I've got that from my mentor, Amen. But the reason it, it bothers me so much is because where Jesus is, is liberty. And if anything you get taught makes you more burdened than you were when you came in, that's not the gospel. Jesus said, take my yoke, it's easy. Take up my, it's light. I did the work, so you don't have to worry about stuff. If everything in your body lines up perfect and I give you a miracle, you can praise me. If you're still waiting on yours, you can praise me. If it shows up gradual, you can praise me. If it never shows up and you breathe your last breath, the very next moment you are standing in the presence of the Lord and you will praise me. So you have to walk through with a little eternal perspective rather than being wrapped up in momentary comfort. So that was the personal practical. This week as we wrap up, I want to talk about why he waits. We were talking about while we wait, the, the trouble of that. Let's remind ourselves why he waits. Because I want to be with Jesus really a lot. Where I have joked, my wife is a woman of great faith, but I have told her, if I drop dead, you leave me dead. Don't you pray me back. Don't you get all anointed. Go off in your prayer language and call me back. You just let me go on. Over there, I'll be thin. Amen. 
when it's all said and done, if we have a heart for Jesus, we want to be where Jesus is. And so there's a groaning, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But it's imperative that we remember why he waits. There's a purpose in it, and we must remember it. So today's a little big picture-ish as we wrap this up. Because when we look into the Word of God, we see God set the whole thing in motion. Big picture. Men fall into sin. Big picture. God begins to show the path of redemption is going to be through the shedding of blood. That without the remission, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And then the old covenant is given where everything is a picture of that redemption. And that you have to have an innocent lamb that can take away the sin of the people. And all of the Levitical priesthood and the prophets come and they're declaring the end. And God has all of these wheels in motion and they're not random at all. This is a precise thing that he has in his own heart till it says in Hebrews that after speaking to us in various times in various ways, he sends his son. And Jesus comes, and the writer of Hebrews says, as the perfect representation of the Father. So that if you ever need to know what God is like, you just look at Jesus. He is the billboard for God. He erases all the mysteries. I'm always puzzled by Christians who say, well, it would be impossible to know what God is like. It's very easy to know what God is like because Jesus came to eliminate all of this mystery. Hebrews says he's the perfect representation of God's person. Walking on the earth, healing and redeeming and showing the church what the church would be. He ascends to heaven and sends the power of the Holy Spirit in the upper room and the church is sent forth into the world with one mission and one purpose. Go tell every person that you can what I have done in redeeming them from their sin. And as many as received him, he gave them the right to become what? The children of God. How many are glad we get the right to become children of God, not just church members? Come on, somebody. When this is all said and done, <laughs> I've got relationship. I call him daddy, and he says, yes, son. Because we are united together through a bond of love and redemption that's inseparable and it's powerful and it's awesome. And this is the big picture. And so when we look at this, what we realize is we exist right now in what theological people call the age of grace. The church is on the earth and the gospel is being preached. And whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everybody say that with me. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's the age of grace. And this is what Peter's talking about when he says, hey, don't forget this one thing. As much in a hurry as you are, one day for the Lord is like a thousand years. And a thousand years is like a day. Now, so, some Bible prophecy teachers really try to get to when it's just a word picture. In other words, God doesn't mark time like you. How many have noticed that the Holy Spirit can come in power and be like, I'm fixing to fix that? And we go, whoo-hoo. And then 17 years later, Come on, somebody. You wait and persevere and cry and wonder if you hurt him. And then it shows up and you go, there it finally is. He goes, what do you mean finally? I said I was doing it. Because why? He's not getting older. God's not having our problems, marking time and aging. So Peter's trying to tell his audience, understand something. The way you measure time is nothing like he measures time, and I believe the implication Peter's making when he goes on to say, because in his long suffering, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. My conviction, God doesn't mark time, he marks people. God is not measuring metrics of 60 seconds, and then this is how many minutes, and I'm going to do this on that day, and I drew an X there because a calendar's going to turn. No, he's far more invested in the redemption of the world, and he's not willing that any should perish. And when the church takes the time to retain the big picture, I ask you, think about it from God's redemptive heart. If tomorrow and all the world's working of the gospel of the church, and there's no way to know, but let's 
let's pick a number. If tomorrow 10,000 people are going to be born again, it changes our perspective when we say, Jesus, come back today. He's not willing that they perish. And so he waits. And if we can remember that that's why he waits, we can make better use of our time and actually redeem the time. Can you say amen? Remember what Matthew 24, verse 14 said. He said, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Everybody just say the word then. You don't have to be a Greek scholar to understand that Jesus was saying, yes, there's a plan, and yes, there's a scroll, and it has seven seals, and when the seven seal breaks, there's seven trumpets, and when the seven trumpet blows, there's seven bowls, and I've got a plan, and all this is prophesied and everything else, but what I'm anchoring the time in is people. This gospel will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then... Why, God, it's getting hard down here. Because I'm not willing that they perish. And I want to encourage you that when our hearts are right, as much as we want to be with him, we don't want them to not be. And so we recognize that this is why he waits. See, the church is the harvesting instrument of the kingdom of God. When we say the word church because we're normal human beings, we think of this place, the church. <clears throat> How many are glad it's a little bigger than this? <laughs> Amen. Scripturally, church, international, all the bodies, all the believers everywhere, big C church as opposed to little C church. And the church is the harvesting instrument of God. We are the ones that carry the gospel. We are the ones that have tasted of amazing grace. And we are the only ones that can tell the story. How are you doing so far? Can I go ahead and teach you a little bit? Think of the book of Acts where it says that Cornelius prayed until he got God's attention so much that God sent an angel to his house. How many are down for this? This man prayed until an angel showed up. And the angel said, hey, you need to hear the gospel. So you need to go get Peter. That angel could not preach the gospel because it's not been given to them to do. The church is the redemptive instrument of God. If you've ever driven past a field with one of those big, beautiful, green John Deere combines going across, Come on, somebody. On the seventh day, God rested. On the eighth day, he created Kenworth. On the ninth day, John Deere. Come on. And, and you drive past, and, and they, that one tractor now has got big tracks on it like a tank, man. It makes army tanks look like Mattel toys. This thing is gigantic. And they put these big harvesting pieces behind it and go driving out across them fields. And one guy is just tearing down whole swaths. And every time I see it, I'm like, and that's us. That's the point. That's what Jesus said. Look at the fields. They're white for the harvest. Pray that the Father would send the workers out into the harvest field. The church is his instrument. So if he's not willing that they should perish, guess who gets to stay? Us. And if we don't remember why we're here, then it all just turns inward and gets weird. If you've ever noticed, Christian folk, we can get odd. We really can. I mean, I don't know if it's just because God picks the weird ones or what, but we just have a tendency. If we don't remember our purpose, we get a little... I know you don't want to think about it because deep down inside we really want to believe we're cool. But if you leave us to our own devices and we lose sight of our purpose, we have a way of getting a little bit weird. And you look and you go, wait a minute. And you always know, like, there's levels to discernment, right? Like when in the church, deep praying saints go, I'm not sure about that. That's one level. And then casual Christians go, hmm, 
I'm not sure about that either. But when the hardcore sinners are like, whoa, y'all are being weird, man. That's a hint right there. It's because it almost invariably what's happened at that place is the purpose of God in having the church here has gotten lost. So now we just turn inward. We pick our favorite doctrine and it's all we talk about. We've picked the appetite of our own flesh and it's all we do. If we're musical, all of a sudden, all we want to do is sing. If we're big intellects, all of a sudden, all we want to do is teach. If people have a certain proclivity to something else, pretty soon the whole church just looks like that gift. And I'm telling you in the name of Jesus, every time you see it, that is not the will of God. The church is a harvesting instrument, and that is ministries that have lost their focus. People coming to Christ is the point of why you're here. Now, before you get real intimidated and weird, don't panic, okay? We're not leaving out from church to go knock doors. Nobody get like, "Uh uh-oh, I've heard these sermons before. No, no, just trust me, let me land the plane. We're going to be all right. I want you to notice in verse 15 of that Peter scripture, 2 Peter 3, verse 15, and what he said there, and I pointed it out when we read through it, he said, notice that the long-suffering of the Lord is salvation. Right? That's the wrong one. Yep, 2 Peter 3, 15. Can we do that? Awesome. Consider that the long-suffering of the Lord is salvation. Every day he waits, more come in. And you can't afford, and this is where I don't want anybody to get intimidated and nobody get condemned. We're not on the front lines here. It's okay. We are a little church in Casper, Wyoming, anchored right in the heart of pro-Trump Republican territory. CNN doesn't even come here to ask me what I think because we're just anchored right in the middle of just America. And we're not on the front lines, and we don't have 50 lost people a week coming in looking for answers, and we don't have some of the opportunities that churches in other cities have, and that's okay. It has nothing to do with feeling bad about where we are. The key is to just take advantage of every opportunity we do get because we recognize that that's why the church is on the earth is to harvest the long-suffering of the Lord is salvation. And every day that he waits, more people come in. And those people Jesus died for, just like he died for me, just like he died for you. He tried to teach us in the parables that there would be some frustration because he said, remember the one about the workers? And he said some people come and they started working at dawn. Then some more showed up about 10, and they started working, and some showed up about 2, and they started working. And a couple jokers didn't even roll out of bed until they came right at closing time, barely picked up one plant. Then when it was time to pay, everybody got paid the same. And the early morning guys started grumbling. Now, see, like, you all are awesome. You wouldn't do that, but I would do that. I'd be like, hey, wait a minute. That Dwight only picked up one plant. I've been out here harvesting all day. I should get more money than him. What was his point? People are going to keep coming in all the way to the very last moment. And the reward is Jesus himself. And that's why it's all the same for everybody. And we have to understand that every day he waits, more people come. And that's why the church is still here. Peter says something in uh, uh, 2 Peter 3. Let's look at verse 11 and verse 12. Because he said something really remarkable, and I want you to see this before we quit. Since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? Now, just leave that up for a second and take a look at what that's saying. He says, what is the church ought to be doing? Looking for the day, right? So we don't cave into the slumber of that scoffer that he talked about. Oh, this is never going to happen because the whole world's just going on. He said, no, no, no. You keep looking, you keep your eye to the horizon, and then he said something crazy, and hasten the day. Bring it in quicker. What? You mean we have a role to play? I thought all of this was circled on a calendar somewhere. 
So I started doing some research. I told you I'm just a simple redneck preacher, but when I care about you guys, I take the time and I dig. And I found me some educated Greek dudes, and they were explaining something very interesting about that word for hastening because some of the translations just changed it into waiting. And the scripture just says, looking, looking for and waiting for the coming of the day of the Lord. But, but I want to tell you something. I'm going to read it right out of it because I'm not very good. And I want you to get it right. I don't want you to have any error. There's a Greek guy that said that this word is in the present active plural tense. And what that makes it is a verb. In other words, it is not a Greek word that speaks to doing nothing and waiting. It is a Greek word that speaks to being involved and doing something about bringing the day of God. The implication of that is amazing if we get a hold of it. Because what did Jesus say? This gospel will be preached to the whole world and then the end will come. Charles Spurgeon used to say, you know, if we could get on with it, we wouldn't have to see the turn of the century. And he was talking about the 1800s. Because once the world has heard, and the idea is that when you and I are active about our Father's business, every single time what we are doing is playing our role in the harvest. And as we do, we are in some small measure hastening the day. And every single time we do it, we're doing our part. Jesus can come a little quicker because that's one more person that heard. Because notice what he said, that a witness to all. He didn't say they'd all receive it, but he does want them all to hear it. And every person that hears your story, every person that hears my testimony, we are involved in the harvest and we are hastening the day by just taking advantage. And this is what I want to talk to you about. It's not necessarily door knocking and putting up a ladder downtown and climbing up on top of the bullhorn and, and hollering at cars as they go by. See, how are we doing? Can I, can I teach you something? So throughout the body of Christ, what you have a lot of people preach out of their own gift. And then they beat you up if you don't have it. <laughs> You've noticed it before. Uh, if, a, if a person's super prophetic then if you don't have three words for people at Walmart today, you're just in sin. And what they're doing is they're projecting their gift on you and going, if you're not like me, something's wrong with you. But that's ridiculous. That's why there's different gifts. So that the church as a whole is equipped. Now, if you have the Holy Spirit, you absolutely could get a prophetic word for somebody at Walmart. But if that's not your principal gift, then that's not going to be what marks your daily life. Right? Right? Well, this has happened in other areas, too. Hardcore teachers have really, so if you don't read your Bible three hours a day, you're just a slacker. You sorry losers. Why aren't you up at 3 o'clock studying it in the, in the Old Testament Greek? Maybe because we have jobs. But what is it? God gifts that gift has a grace, that grace makes that easy, and if they're not careful, that person will project that on you. If you're not doing what I'm doing, well, I'm telling you right now, evangelists have done this for years in the body of Christ. Some are given the gift of evangelism. By the grace of God, it's so easy for them to share the gospel. They can pick souls off like apples falling off of a tree, walking down the street, suss people right out, talk to anybody. It's a spiritual gift. It's awesome. It's amazing. And not everybody has it. So I'm not talking about if you don't have four tracks in your pocket and you don't, don't go knock three doors today, you're just a slack. No. I'm saying that if you know why we're here, he waits because of redemption, then what it causes me to do is just take full advantage of every opportunity I do get. I don't have to be obnoxious to try to make them happen, but I don't let them pass by in some kind of slumber either. 
I'm awake, I'm alert, I'm on it. This is the whole reason the church is here, and this has turned where I've had this encounter with this person where they're talking to me, and I'm not letting this go. I'll be late to whatever I was on my way to because this is the gospel, and this is our purpose, and I will be a witness, and I will tell this person my story. And if it happens once a month, hallelujah. And if it happens once every six months, praise God. And if it happens every day, well, then you get the gold star, but just don't let it go by. We are here to take what we know and tell it because that's what a witness is. Witnesses don't win court cases. They just answer questions. You don't have to know every scripture. Just answer. That's actually in the Bible. You want to see it? 1 Peter chapter 3, and that was the scripture we went to a second ago. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts means separate it. Jesus is Lord everywhere I go. Wow. Serving Jesus everywhere I go. Watching for my opportunity everywhere I go because I don't know. And always being ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that's in you. This takes all the guesswork out of being a witness. When they ask, give them a real answer. Give them the gospel. And if somebody asks again, you don't have any control over that. Live your life for Jesus. Be a light shining in the darkness and wait. And the moment somebody goes, hey, what do you think about all this stuff? Because I'm pretty stressed out and you look like you have peace. Well, and in that moment, see, that's where we have to be on task and on mission and on purpose because what it could, well, of course I have peace. Because Trump, how about Jesus is Lord of my life? Jesus is going to be Lord of my life if Donald wins. He's going to be Lord of my life if he doesn't win. The kingdom's a lot bigger than the politics. And if somebody asks me for my peace, I dare not give them politics. That is my moment to preach the gospel. I used to worry about stuff, and then I found Christ. Oh, you're one of those Christian people? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, unapologetically, he loves me, he changed my life, and he loves you, and he'll change yours too. And you can't even get in trouble for that because they asked. All over the world, I've had people, well, I can't talk about Jesus at work. You can if they ask. I've read those policy manuals. You can't walk in and interrupt and preach. You didn't. They asked. Now, if when it's over, you're giving an altar call at your desk, so much the better. But you didn't start it. You're just answering. The prayer of the church needs to be, God, let them see something in us that would cause them to ask. And the powerful thing about waiting for somebody to ask is you just eliminated all of the guesswork because they're obviously looking or they wouldn't have asked. You don't even have to tape your Bible to a bed and go beat anyone up. You don't, have to, you don't have to cruise the hallways at work. Sinner. You, you, don't have, you don't have to do nothing weird. Just live and be nice. Spiritual gift of nice. Come on, somebody. Baptism of holy niceness. Just be there, salt and light, and loving people and being compassionate. And when they say, man, the boss yelled at you for 20 minutes, how come you didn't yell back? Jesus. Everyone else is freaking out because they say we're getting laid off, and all you did was whistle going down the hallway. What are you, rich? In ways you don't understand. Jesus. We just watch for our moments because we know that every time we clearly give witness, we hasten the day. And when we wonder, well, why would we do it? If we can remember, it's the whole reason we're here. It's why he waits. Because that soul matters to him. 
And the scripture says one plants and one waters. Most people don't accept Christ the first time they hear it. So you might have to plant a seed and somebody else has to water it. And you go, well, that sure takes a lot of time. God's got a thousand years today. Oh, come on. That's good preaching whether you want it to be or not. God cares about their soul, and you ought to be okay with it, and I ought to be okay with it because he cared about ours. I know we don't routinely just say, let's all stand up and announce what kind of mess we were when God found us, but we were all, come on, somebody, we weren't all cleaned up, perfect little church members sitting in the back, the devil is a lie. You were a mess, and you not only got saved from what you did, you got saved from what you were about to do. Come on, God intervened in your life because you were a mess just like me. But the grace of God grabs a hold. And that's what we're watching for, is moments when the grace of God is trying to grab a hold of the next person. If we can just remember, brothers and sisters, that's why he waits, is because they matter. That's the whole point. That's the whole point. And I don't have to sweat what I don't get to do. I just take advantage of what I get to do. I was on the phone with somebody a few weeks ago, and, and uh, they were telling me about this great revival that they're seeing in this country in Africa. And my, my friend said, you want to go with me? And I said, why? He said, well, are you kidding? Uh, didn't you hear what I said about what's happening? I said, yeah, it's already happening. I think the point was supposed to be we go somewhere where nothing's happening. Oh, come on. See, I know. No, it's way easier to just chase blessings around. I was at so-and-so's meeting, and he breathed on me, and I had a vision, and I was at sister's conference, and she sprayed oil in my face, and I had another vision, and we just chase all this stuff around and entertain ourselves. No, 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 the calling of God is, I don't care if that church is on fire, then that's the last town that needs me. I need to walk out here on the edge of an oil patch someplace where nothing is happening and make something happen there. God didn't call you to go enjoy somebody else's move. God called you to be a move of yourself. And we go where we can and we do what we can and then we leave the results with Jesus. And some days it'll look like we're really getting a lot done. And other days it'll look like we're not getting anything done. And that's why that scripture's in there about, so just don't grow weary in your well-doing. But in due time, you will harvest if you just faint not. Just remember that they are the reason that he waits. I heard a very well-meaning preacher one time get up and preach some horribly erroneous stuff about how God waits to give us time to be ready for heaven. We're we're not holy enough yet. He's coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. and, And I thought, then you didn't read that scripture about how we change in a moment. Come on, somebody, let the preacher have a little fun. You didn't read that part about how in a moment all that stuff just changes. No, 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 we're not waiting on nothing except he cares about the next person as much as he cared about you. And that's why he waits. How are you? Did you do okay today? We're going to take communion together because that's the meal that the whole body of Christ takes together to celebrate new covenant that we have in the blood of Jesus. So why don't you stand with me for a second? We're going to pray. We're going to pray, and then we're going to go pick up these wonderfully, (laughs) these wonderfully packaged communion meals, and and we're going to and we're going to rejoice. Amen. Father, we love you so much, and we are amazed how you love us, that you wanted us. No man comes to the Father except the Father draws him. Our salvation was not us choosing you. Our salvation was you choosing us, and we give you praise. You wanted us in your family. And we rejoice in it, and we recognize that there's still room at your table 
for some more. And that's why you wait. And so every day that you wait is actually proof of your heart for mankind. If you were over us, if you were done with it, you would just call the church home and let it fall. But you still want more children in your house. And you still want more to taste of amazing grace. And you still want more and more to be washed completely pure by the blood of Jesus. And so we love you for loving us and ask you to fill our hearts with the same kind of love for them. Because God, you are waiting because they matter as much as we did. And help us have hands that are always reaching, and hearts that are always loving, and voices that are always available, that you could use us in any possible way, in any opportunity that presents itself, to give clear witness to the truth of who Jesus is, that the gospel could continue to go forward. And we just give you praise today. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of the communion meal, and we just ask you to bless our time together as we receive it. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. So you can make your way trying to not clog up, amen, social distance, all that good stuff. And we're going to take it together once everybody has it. funny to just ask this. What do you guys think of that? That's the nylon guitar setting. Close your eyes, it sounds like it's raining. It's really cool. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just up here, that's what it sounds like. It's pretty awesome. But, anyways, I'm just enjoying my life. You'll forgive me. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, Paul tells us that he took some bread and he prayed over it. broke it as he blessed it and he said take and eat this it's going to be my body that will be broken for you and do this often and remember me so Lord as we take this little element of bread today we're so impressed we're so amazed and just in awe what you were doing allowing yourself to be broken because no one took your life from you you laid it down and when you did (laughs) you had us in mind you saw all the way forward to this very morning you saw 
every person in this room that would be calling the Father their Father. And you were willing to do it for us. And so we take a moment and remember you and we thank you for that sacrifice. And we receive this simple element with just gratitude in our hearts. Thank you, Jesus, for allowing yourself to be broken for us. You can take the bread. then you took a cup and you said this is going to be a new covenant for you it's going to be in my blood and you allowed your blood to be spilled because you were the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world Every time we receive this cup, we just celebrate the new beginning that we found in you because that blood was spilled that day. And in the same way, Lord, that that day the blood hit the ground and it said that the graves were opened, that some of the dead came out a little early and were seen walking around in the same way your blood makes us live and we praise you today thank you for the power of your blood to set us free and make us new and I pray that as we receive it our understanding of it our appreciation of it would just multiply and grow until we would want the whole world to know what we found in you. You can take the cup.
<laughs> we love you, Lord. We thank you for your presence here today. We thank you for your word and the truth of it. We thank you for the privilege of being in a church. <laughs> thank you, Lord. We don't take that for granted. We thank you, Father, that we have a place and that we have each other and that we have you. Go with each one, Lord, and let your love just shower over them all day. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. Amen. Well, it was great having you here today. I hope you were blessed and encouraged in some kind of way. Go with God and be happy and let Holy Spirit niceness be your guide. Amen? If you haven't voted, vote. If you can't remember who to vote for, ask. Amen. God bless you. <laughs>